Mad, bad, and dangerous to know, but oh, how we love them. They are the heroes and villains of their own stories. They are the heart of romances and gothic novels. Hello nerds, my name is Eva and today I'm going to talk about the Byronic Hero. The term Byronic comes from Lord Byron, a 19th century poet who wrote poetry and dramatic words featuring different dark hero archetypes. The Byronic Hero combines the traditional tragic hero and the villain, so he's basically an anti-hero. In addition, the Byronic Hero as we know it today is a compilation of the different archetypes that Byron brought together. According to Peter Turslap, we can distinguish three 18th century hero types, the child of nature, the hero of sensibility, and the gothic villain. And four romantic hero types, the novel Outlaw, the Faust gem figure, Satan Prometheus, and Cain and the Wandering Jew. These figures lay the foundations for the Byronic hero. The archetype also draws inspiration from Lord Byron's life and personality. Byron certainly didn't know that he was going to inspire a long tradition of literary works featuring brooding male characters. Cora Palfi explains, The Byronic hero is characterized as a rebel who stands apart from society and societal expectations, who is deeply jaded, morally superior, and obsessed with lost love. Despite his unique features, the Byronic hero is not dissociated from early heroes, but is rather a continuation of them. According to Peter Turslap, the Byronic hero has borrowed characteristics from the Gothic villain, in his looks, his mysterious past, and his secret scenes, and he has retained characteristics from the men of feeling, in his tender sensibilities and his undying fidelity to the women he loves, but he is more than this, he is also a romantic rebel. The Byronic hero is a product of his time. He appears mostly in times of rebellion. This archetype actually precedes Byron's era. We see fragments of him in Shakespeare's plays in characters such as Richard III and Macbeth, but it is John Milton who fleshes him out. We cannot talk about Byronic heroes without mentioning Satan, the hottest Byronic hero of all. In Paradise Lost, Milton gives us a Satan who is not a villain, but an anti-hero. He humanizes the devil not by making him good, but by making him complex. Unlike previous depictions of the devil, Milton gives Satan human feelings, motives, and eloquence. Anna Paolucci states, Milton's Satan has all the tragic grandeur of a Greek hero. His strength of purpose, misdirected as it is, arouses our admiration, and admiration gives way to a kind of pity as we watch the anguish of his spirit. His defiance against the superior forces which have destroyed his glory and peace is tempered by an emotional sensitivity that calls forth our sympathy. But perhaps the most impressive and moving quality of Milton's Satan is his appreciation of all that is good and beautiful. He is painfully sensitive to light and love, his despair is awakened sharply at the sight of heaven and Eden. The question is, why would a Protestant writer create such a sublime representation of the devil? There are many possible answers to that question, but the one that concerns us here is that Milton was writing Paradise Lost during the English Civil War, and he was against the monarchy. He actually wrote pamphlets to support the Republican government, where he justified the chopping of the monarch's heads. Many elements of the poem reflect the political events of Milton's time. What is interesting to me here is the themes of rebellion and tyranny. Since I don't want to get into arguments with Miltonian scholars, I'm just going to say that these themes can be interpreted in different ways. For instance, Satan can be seen as a king taking advantage of the power that God has given him to overthrow his superior, so you might read the conflict as an abuse of the monarchic power. Nonetheless, we cannot ignore Satan's rebellion and the fact that God himself is portrayed as a tyrant, in which case, Satan becomes an anti-hero, fighting for his right to be treated as an equal. Satan's tragedy is that, in defying God's power, he ends up turning into a tyrant. So why is it important that Milton wrote Paradise Lost during the English Civil War? Because again, the dark hero is a product of an era, especially of times of rebellion. Throughout the book, Satan also has to deal with the consequences of his actions. 
Satan goes as far as saying, which way I fly is hell, myself and hell. I think these lines really convey what the Byronic hero is. He is a force of nature, tormented by his past and the decisions he has made. He rather revolts and faces the consequences than submit to a higher power and live in peace. The major connection between Byron's heroes and Milton's Satan is that both refuse to submit to a higher authority. Lord Byron was the one who gave a face to the dark hero archetype. Not only did Byron embody the qualities of the now known Byronic hero, but he also standardized the features of the figure through his depictions. Now, before people come for my head, I'm going to say that I am aware that Byron was far from perfect. In fact, he was very troublesome, and that's an understatement. Nonetheless, many aspects of his life were inspiring, not only to me, but to other writers of his time. And we're going to see why in a minute. George Gordon Byron was born in 1788 in London. He was born with a club foot. This fact is fundamental if we want to understand his personality, because this malformity shaped his decision making and consequently the course of his life. Byron walked with a limp, so he felt he had to make it up for his disability and prove his prowess in every possible way. He became pretty good at sports. In 1810 he even swung the Hellespont, which took him an hour and 10 minutes. So he was a very brisk man, a man of action, he loved challenges and thought he could do it all. As a romantic poet, he was also a radical. But unlike the first generations of romantics, Byron thought it was not enough to use poetry to speak out. Poets also must practice what they preach. He always wanted to revolt against oppression and power. Unfortunately, his participation in the English Parliament did not go well, and his scandal sexual life forced him to leave England in 1816. Law Byron was openly bisexual. He loved going to Greece because there, at least before 1834, sodomy was not illegal, unlike in England. Being bisexual was the least of Byron's problems. He was also a rake and had different affairs with ladies of the high society but his scandalous sexual life was overshadowed by incest. Yes, you heard me well. Lord Byron was in love with his half-sister Augusta Lee. They had an affair and an illegitimate child resulted from this affair. However, I will argue that this wasn't the worst thing that he did. Sure, it was still gross, but he and his sister were consenting adults when they met and began their affair. So he had to leave England amid this scandal, and not content with the chaos he had havoc, he fathered another illegitimate child with Mary Shelley's stepsister Claire Claremont. It was not until 1824 that Byron saw the chance to become the hero he aspired to be. Instead of paying his debts, Byron sold one of his states and donated approximately £30,000 to support the Greek independence war against the Ottoman Empire. He was planning to fight in the war, but he fell ill with a cold, which apparently ended up being a case of malaria. One thing led to another, and after being bloodlet and losing one third of his blood, he died. Mikan explains that Byron's death proved useful to the revolutionary Greek forces, which often found it difficult to coordinate their efforts. Byron's death helped to unify the various revolutionary elements even as it also helped to consolidate European support for the Greek cause. By the time of his death, Byron had published highly celebrated works such as Child Harold's Pilgrimage, Don Juan, Manfred and the Corsair. Some of the most popular Byronic heroes of his works are Manfred, Cain and Conrad. Lord Byron lived a life of excesses and extremes, and this reflects in his characters. Mikan argues that all of Byron's heroes we know are surrogates of himself, more or less displaced. They are as well figures moving under the domination of an often obscure purpose and destiny. And Peter Thorslap explains that the sins for which the Byronic hero accepts responsibility are not those of his misdeeds, which society considers most reprehensible. Not only are his sins his own, but his moral values are also his own. He chooses his values in open defiance of the codes of society. This is how Byron's morality and regret also worked. 
He never regretted the affair with his sister. In fact, he never stopped pining for her. But I think he was sorry for the dishonor he brought to his family because he never saw his daughter again. In a similar way, Byron didn't care about his debts, yet he donated all that money to Greece. The historian Thomas Babington Macaulay describes the Byronic hero as a man proud, moody, cynical, with defiance on his brow and misery in his heart, a scorner of his kind, implacable in revenge, yet capable of deep and strong affection. Like Milton's Satan, the Byronic hero embodies larger ideas, such as their transition from one era to another. On the one hand, he represents the Romantic period revolting against the neoclassic ideas, emotion and passion against reason. On the other hand, the Byronic hero's gloominess represents Byron's discontent with England's and Europe's political and social prospects. Although Milton set an antecedent for the Byronic hero and Byron cemented the archetype, John William Polidori and Mary Shelley were the ones who popularized the figure. Polidori was Byron's personal physician, which made Polidori also Byron's companion because they would travel together. However, they had a love-hate relationship going on, especially on Polidori's side. I think it was mostly one-sided. I have come to believe that Polidori was in love with Byron, or at least he was in awe with Byron and wanted to be his friend. I mean, who didn't? But Byron never treated Polidori as an equal, didn't seem to care for Polidori, nor did he show respect for his friend. The thing is that Polidori was in Villa Diodati when Percy and Mary came to visit Byron, and when Byron proposed the contest to write horror stories. Everyone knows the rest is history. From this stormy night, Mary came up with Frankenstein and Polidori with the vampire. Contrary to the popular belief, Byron was actually the one who came up with the vampire. He began to write the story as a fragment, but never finished writing it. Instead, he told the rest of the story orally by the fire. Polidori wrote a different story that night of a lady with a skull head. Everyone mocked him as usual and he wasn't happy about it. Three years later, Polidori published The Vampire. Law Byron's story inspired Polidori's story. The problem was that Polidori based the antagonist and vampire of his story, Law Riven, on Lord Byron himself. Lord Riven is not only the first vampire character in an English short story, but the story also transforms the folkloric vampire and gives us the pop culture vampire we now know. The vampire goes from being a peasant to becoming an aristocrat. Polidori's vampire does not live in cemeteries, he can be found in ballrooms seducing young ladies with his wealth, title and charm. The story's protagonist is a young man who is infatuated with Lord Riven, and together they go on a tour around Europe. So the vampire here is portrayed not only as a very sexual being, but also as a bisexual. Sounds familiar? In other words, without Byron and Polidori, we wouldn't have sexy Byronic vampires because the folkloric vampire is a revenant who lives in a grave, stinks, and appears at night to suck at the blood of his loved ones. Basically, a zombie. Unlike Polidori, Mary Shelley remained Byron's friend even after he died, and she based many of her characters on Byron. Thomas More states, Mary Shelley seems to have known Byron thoroughly, and always wins up her account of his bad traits with, but still he was very nice. She describes Lord Byron as a fascinating, faulty, childish, philosophical being, daring the world, docile to a private circle, impetuous and indolent, gloomy, and yet more gay than any other. According to Ernest G. Lovell, Mary Shelley based some of her characters on Percy Shelley and others on Byron. Those based on Byron not only have his looks, but also his voice. For instance, Raymond Lodore and Castruccio are brunettes with black or brown hair and dark eyes. Their voices are described as sensible and impassioned. Lovell argues that the impact of Byron's voice upon Mary became in some sort almost a symbol of the highly disturbing effect which his personality was able to exert upon her. Mary Shelley's Byronic heroes are all, of course, creatures of vigorous male beauty. Lovell notices that they also have changeful features, which convey their quick sensibilities and inner conflicts.
Because the Byronic hero is made of different archetypes, scholars are yet to agree on what a Byronic hero is. The problem is that they are trying to define the Byronic hero as they define other archetypes. To me, the Byronic hero is a secondary archetype because it has more to do with the character's personality traits and aspect than with their profession or journey. For instance, the main archetype of many Byronic heroes, especially in vampire stories, is the Wandering Jew, which is a character that has been cursed with immortality. However, not every Wandering Jew character is a Byronic hero. It depends on how the character confronts and reacts to the curse. You can certainly argue that characters such as Severus Snape, Edward Cullen, and Loki are Byronic heroes. Would I agree? I don't know, because sometimes it is very hard to tell. Ironically, this figure is so complex that it is even difficult to define. What we can agree on is that the Byronic hero appears very often in romance novels. He is also known as the Alpha Hole, or the asshole with redeeming qualities. I find this very interesting, especially because of the times in which we live. There's one thing in particular that I consider important to mention. On the one hand, today's society is more diverse and open regarding race, gender and sexuality than 50 years ago. Most women are also feminist and we are more outspoken than we used to be. Every day we fight against misogyny and toxic masculinity. Some men tend to misinterpret feminist and LGBTQ plus messages and think that we are pushing an agenda and trying to make them less masculine. When in reality, all we ask is for society to give us equal opportunity and to respect our body autonomy. Now, the Byronic hero has a rebirth in the midst of this social context. Nonetheless, he is a very masculine character, a man of action who knows how to fix it all. He is super confident about his sexuality and rarely intimidated by others, which shows that someone can be masculine and still be nice to women and queer people, or that someone can be gay or transgender and still be conventionally masculine. In conclusion, the Byronic hero shows that there's nothing wrong with traditional masculinity, because the idea does not entail being misogynist. Treating people with the respect they deserve will not make men less manly. The Byronic hero's masculinity is meant to appeal to both the female and male gays. He also lives on the margins of society, which makes him an adversary to the patriarchy and other systems of oppression. He is usually intelligent and well-educated, which is a plus. And last but not least, he is vulnerable. He bends his knee to no one except his beloved. The Byronic hero is a fantasy. He is an unrealistic representation of masculinity because Simply, no one can be that perfect. He does have issues, but they are usually unrelated to the issues we see in men nowadays. The Byronic hero's issues are family courses, incest, and murder. You know, the usual gothic stuff. Fiction is simply the best place, the safest place to love the unlovable and to redeem the unredeemable. I love Byron's poetry and the Byronic hero is my favorite archetype. However, I wish I could see more diverse depictions of this figure. It would be amazing to have more Byronic female protagonists or Byronic transgender characters. By the way, if you ever want to make me read a book, just tell me that the main character is mad, bad and dangerous to know. It always works. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel and let me know in the comments your thoughts on the Byronic hero. Once again, thank you so much for watching and for your support. I'll see you on the next video. Bye!